You ever killed before? Not yet. I was born Angelo. You murdered my father. Before we begin, I think there's a few things to address about videos like this, but if you want to get straight into the actual meat of the video, you can skip ahead to the next chapter. But watch this section if you plan on leaving a rude comment. Also, I'll be sectioning the entire video so you can skip spoilers for other series I'll be referencing as examples. But first, I want to stress the subjectivity of narrative. The same thing which allows it to be impactful to individuals is also what makes it so hard to classify. What makes one series amazing could be very similar to what makes another one awful because a story isn't individual parts, it's a collection of them. For instance, in Modica Magica, the mentor's death trope is key to understanding what follows in the series, where most of the time it ends up being a cheap plot driver that doesn't really impact anything. So you can't say a mentor's death is an awful trope, because sometimes it will be and sometimes it won't be, it's being objective about something subjective. However, with specificity, we can wear this down from pointless bickering to something more useful. You can look at why it worked and say, because we see the main character's reactions to this legacy, we get an insightful look at the idea of mentors on the whole. So we can say something like a mentor's death with different reactions is better. Now, taking that to the extreme would be too time consuming and see diminishing returns. So there's a give and take with this as eventually you're simply describing one particular series. But all of this is to say, yes, this is subjective, but I think there's value in trying to find something objective in it all, creating guidelines for a story in a sense. Hints that avoid saying do or don't, but instead consider this before you do or don't. So if you disagree with anything I'm saying here, whether you think I'm wrong, miss something, or something like the 91 days more than me, that's fair. As long as you're not rude, I'd love to hear why you agree or disagree in the comments. Yes, because it helps engagement, but also because it gives me a better view on these subjective issues and helps me to round out my ideas for the future as well. I'm not a story expert, I'm a person with a computer and a YouTube channel. Similarly to that, what we're about to cover here is in no way an exhaustive list of what was good or bad about the show. There will be things I missed for sure because weekly videos and day work is a sadly strict timeline. But with that out of the way, we can move forward here onto the real meat of this video. I guess I could describe my gripes with 91 days and the point of this video as it feels more like a stringing together of rushed arcs than a complete story. Naturally, part of this is down to the timing since it's a 12-parter and not 24+. plus. However, I don't think simply extending the runtime would fix the issues with the story. They run a lot deeper than that. Although it is undeniable that some extra episodes would alleviate the issues as they would with any story. But when there's 12 episode gems out there like Death Parade, Monica Magica, most of Erased, Mob Psycho, Sunny Boy, and even more I could go on listing, I'm not going to hold back simply because the anime was shorter. Similarly, I'll only be using other 13 or less episode anime for the fairest comparisons in this video. Now, a big part of what allows those short stories to be good is knowing that they have to make a very tight and concise plot. Death Parade tells a lot of stories, but simple ones which focus on emotional impact rather than complex details or relationships. Monica Magica is the opposite, focusing on complex characters and their winding relationships, but keeping it to such a small cast that there's really no issue. 91 Days didn't have these kinds of aspects in mind because its setup is fundamentally flawed for such a short series. It's about warring mafia families during Prohibition, which plays out intermingled with Angelo's quest for revenge on the Benetti family and his rivalry with Nero specifically. For this to work and feel fleshed out, the families have to feel like families, which means a whole host of characters with their own unique relationships and motivations. Those who disagree and sow tension and doubt, the traitors, the schemers, the ones who just want to be happy, and so on. But this creates a war of screen time. There's Angelo and Nero, and Nero and his family, all of whom need to feel like full characters of their own for Angelo's revenge, the destruction of the Veneta family while Nero watches it burn, to feel impactful. This in turn also relies on the other families and their wars, which takes even more time away from the rivalry, which I'd argue the series seems to be pretty heavily sold on. What I'm getting at here is that the concept relies on a lot of characters who need meaningful relationships, but there just isn't time for this. 
so it generally becomes a case of exceptionally short character arcs as they're often introduced or begin their development in the same episode that they're resolved in. Mono's death is really what kickstarts the main plot for Nero, but he only had one episode to be solidified as Nero's best friend. Theo serves as the voice of reason in rooms full of stupid men who can't get over their pride, which would be a nice touch if she had any meaningful scenes with them before she's used to show how the family is being torn apart. There's Gonzo, the man who sent the letter to Angelo and the fourth person there for the murder of his family, and he... Well, he wants to take over the family, and that's about it. He just wants power. He's around for the whole anime, but really only serves as this plot convenience. There's also any number of antagonists who are completely unnecessary, like Serpente, Mad Mac, and Stega, who serve as exactly the same thing, just plot points to move the story along. I mean, this, this is the character list for 12 episodes. I'm gonna have to keep talking nonsense while this scrolls to keep it at a reasonable speed to even fit in this video. I don't know how long I'm gonna have to keep going for, so I'm just gonna keep going and hopefully it'll end right about now. All of these characters mean that instead of a deeply developed rivalry which plays out against one of the characters' family relationships, we have a bunch of characters who exist in the same space and step forward for a moment to fulfill their sole purpose before being banished from the stage. They're all static characters, everyone is who they start as, with only one immediate and massive change for Angelo obviously, and maybe the slightest shift for Nero, but that's really all. Did you kill him? Fortune is a fickle whore, but she does smile, and sometimes she tells you secrets. <laughs> no point playing a role unless you're gonna give it out. Something not helping the massive cast of characters is how similar they all are. There's a select few categories of motivation they can fall into. There's those who want power, those who want to save their family or friends, and um, dead people? Nero wants the family to survive, same with Theo, Vincent, and Frate, who also wants power, along with the characters who simply want power like Fongo, Gonzo, Strega, Orko, Ronaldo, and probably even more. I can't tell you how worn out these motivations feel by the end of the series. The final episode depends on a few idiots who want immediate power and think they can play everyone to get it. Is that a good commentary on power-craving idiots? Yes! Is it a meaningful one? No, because none of the minor characters leave an impact except maybe Frate, but then the next episode changes gears immediately to a new introduction, so even this feels moot. But he is one of the few characters to actually make Angelo's plan feel like cold manipulation, and not a wild ride across Lawless where he simply lucks or plot conveniences himself into the next situation. Angelo's interactions with these men don't add much to the series, because you could interchange a lot of them and have the same end result. There's no unique addition they bring to the series. Angelo killing Vano is only important because he's Nero's friend, not for anything of his own character. They're all in the same situation, so they need distinguishing motivations for being there, and they lack that in full. I'd actually like to point to Tokyo Ghoul as a comparison here, because it's also at its core a story about warring families. The ghouls, which are divided into their own sections like Algiri Tree or Anteku, and the CCG, which is against them all as well. Some don't make a choice to enter these families, the same as the Mafia, but instead deal with the expectations and justify what they do for their companions. They all kill or refuse to kill as one of their main actions, what sets them apart is why they do it. Is it a unique perspective? Is it a sense of responsibility to the community? Maybe it's a strict and unfledging idea of justice, or it could be pure madness that's baked into the very fabric of their being, or maybe a want for freedom like anyone else should have. And from there, these motivations clash with the need for power and against others who have power. They're all in this together in one way or another, so how do they deal with that? Those distinctions and different takes are what makes the original season a standout from the rest, quite ironically as Route A onward fails in a very similar way to 91 Days, a bloated cast which fails to develop itself in any unique ways. Also yes, a first season is technically cheating on the 12 episode rule, but Tokyo Ghoul wraps up its most important thematic ideas in those 12 episodes, so I'm going to count it here. But back to 91 Days. This large cast which is being cycled in and out adds to the prevailing pacing of the anime, one which is exceptionally stop and then start. But it could be described the same way even with a more contained cast. 
Angelo locks himself into the very bar that Nero is in, giving him an in for the wedding to sell Corteo's moonshine to the family at just the right time that they just so happen to need an outsider for this job. Then, oh god, it blows up and turns into a family war and Nero has to flee for one whole episode. And then he comes back to town, even though he and Angelo changed nothing of their own volition. When this miniature arc first started, I thought, oh, this is going to be the series, them on the run. For a 12 episode series, that makes sense. But it's just a short miniature arc that's resolved outside of the main pair's hands, and then they return to continue the plot. For other examples, later on, there's the introduction of a new Prohibition officer who threatens Nero's moonshine operations, and we never hear from him again after half an episode. Nero and Angelo have to help Fongo take over the Orko family, and it has some ripples on the plot, but not as many as you think for such a grand action, and it's very sudden, and the effects are relayed through side characters, and then he's killed for it to have that impact, meaning one of the few developed minor characters is gone before the finale. And Fongo actually had some of the only relevant single episode development in the anime. Specifically, in Nero's meeting with Orko, we see that his family is all yes-men. We know from earlier interactions Fongo has with Nero that he hates Yes Men. So when Fongo takes over, it's fitting that he tricks them in such a sick way that pokes fun at their instant acceptance of everything the boss says and makes them eat their former boss. But instead of him being the final villain, it's a family we're just meeting in episode 11 with the Galassias. Why not use the developed character you already had? <coughs> Rise of Skywalker and Kylo Ren. <coughs> but this is part of the stop and start nature of the anime, how reliant developments are on new or seriously minor characters. It takes things out of the main pair's hands, or even people they've interacted with, and puts it into those who are just stepping into the spotlight, so it feels detached from what Nero and Angelo just went through. Again, Nero returning to the city, the conflict that leads him to Fongo, an injury of a minor character at the hands of more minor characters, the Galassias destroying the Venetis, Gonzo being Angelo's mole in the family, and so on. Flat characters drive forward singular miniature arcs so it doesn't leave a lasting mark. This is really a conceptual issue within the anime, as all of these miniature arcs take place in the same context, but move forward in this weird way one at a time, disjointed from the one before it, and not really connecting to the one after it, and without a wholly consistent cast to maintain a sense of self, it's not a smooth motion forward. We do have an example of something which has an extensive cast and dependent miniature arcs done well in Death Parade, though. The premises are exceptionally different, and that's key here, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Death Parade set guidelines which made these conflicting elements work. Each miniature story would have the same defined start and end, with a very simple parallel main plot running next to it. The interactions of these temporary characters would influence one of those miniature defined endings, and then move forward as the main characters slowly changed around these interactions and reflected on themselves. The single episode characters are gone and the plot stays the same, but their impact is felt in noticeable ways through the main characters. I've spoken on this before, the genius of Death Parade is focusing purely on emotions in a simple context, so that's the only thing to be focused on and understood. Now, this almost isn't a fair comparison because these two anime are so far apart in concept. But that's something we have to understand about 91 Days, its concept required some downright masterful execution to work as well as intended, where something like Death Parade has more wriggle room because of its concept. Not everything had to be done exceptionally well, just one thing did, emotional reaction. 91 Days had an extensive plot and cast which required way too much to live up to the full potential of the idea, and ended up with exceptionally flat characters and arcs to get the plot across. Speaking of flat characters, something else adding to this feeling is the lack of a ripple effect in those characters. There are some moments that are well crafted and could have major impacts. Nero having to kill his own brother is exactly what Angelo's revenge is supposed to be. It's one of the few moments of careful manipulation on his part, and watching it happen is something, but it doesn't really change Nero in the next episode we move on from it immediately. His motivation is the same, the way he acts and carries himself doesn't shift at all, the relationships with his family are as they always have been, and this makes it even more convenient for the plot. If this didn't change him, why should it impact us at all? This is the same with Corteo's temporary insanity. I have my complaints about him killing Fongo as I've said, and it doesn't make sense to me that the madman would go out so easily either. 
But this brutal murder is exactly what the anime needed. This is the toll that these kinds of people take on those who are more innocent around them, how these lives turn men into beasts both by and against their will. But after this, and then after being tortured, Corteo is just... he's fine. He went full on insane, but the results of that never show in his character later. Him and Angelo go on and have their happy, fun, supposedly character-building moments, and that's it. You could say this does have some impact on him by the fact he returns to sacrifice himself for Angelo, and his motivation may have shifted to say wanting to save others from becoming beasts like he did, but that was only temporary, and although having to kill Corteo changes Angelo, it doesn't affect his actions or the plan or the overall plot at all, so it feels like a moot point. Also, did I mention all of this relies on minor characters of Gonzo and... G G Gado? This guy who jumped from family to family is a plot convenience. There are moments that should change and impact the characters, and they just don't. At times, it actually did have some build-up, but the payoff is always forgotten seconds later. And if we're gonna talk about ripple effects in characters, you know we're going to go to Monica Magica. We can look specifically at a character who lost everything and became a monster in Sayaka. Every action she witnesses has a ripple effect on her character in subtle ways that reveal themselves with a little bit of consideration. She has a moment of helplessness where it feels like her life is over and Mami saves her, becoming her hero and someone she loves. She's in love with Kyosuke who feels like his life is over, so she uses her wish to be like Mami and save him. This makes her happier, witnessing the short-term effects of her action but things start to fall apart over time, and it forces her to reconsider herself and her motivations. She witnesses other people who are openly selfish, the thing she begins to fear she is, and this hardens her resolve to not be in unhealthy ways because of her now dead mentor of mommy setting such a perfect, in heavy quotes, example. Slowly angering with the result of her actions, she drives away the people close to her, only worsening how she feels. Eventually, she goes insane and runs out of ways to justify her own actions, and the result of that insanity ends her life and changes the world around her. Her story of becoming a monster and going insane is caused by those before her and never leaves the minds of those who remain after her. Mommy's impact becomes her impact, which becomes Madoka's impact. It's a natural chain of motivation and character changes which influence each other in ways that can be clearly observed, but also rewards additional analysis because it doesn't shove everything in your face. This would be like if Nero began to make bad decisions after killing Frate, which slowly led to the family's demise by his own hand. Angelo's actions would influence him, which would influence the family's fate, rather than the disconnected sections of tragedy that we got. You got things turned on the head. Avenging them is the only thing my life has worked. Well, any ideas? Thought if I saw it through to the end, maybe it'd give me a reason to live or something, you know? But there ain't anything left. Now, aside from just the characters and the plot, there's something within both of those that adds to this disconnected stop and start feeling. And that's that every episode or scene was obviously designed with one single idea in mind, and those ideas aren't as connected as they should be. Nero having to flee the city is obviously to try and rush his and Angela's relationship forward by forcing them to interact alone. The Prohibition Officer was half an episode dedicated to showing that Corteo thinks Angelo has become a monster, something we already knew well before this and then before Corteo becoming one himself. There's a whole host of scenes where Nero makes some remark which is ironic in Angelo's presence, like saying he was a great actor for making up a speech about how the Venetis killed his family. Everything is done to accomplish a single outcome, whether that's moving the plot forward, revealing a simple motivation, or crafting into the miniature tragedy. That's why I decided not to tackle the series in any thematic way. Every idea I started to look into was dropped in the next episode when they moved on to something else. Very few scenes are actually pulling double duty or anything close to that, as in deepening a relationship while driving the plot forward, or cracking a joke that also reveals something about the character's inner thoughts. Instead, it's doing one or the other independently. It creates the feeling I keep mentioning because nothing is moving forward together. You look at the plot, then the characters, then the plot, then the characters, and so on as the series progresses. In a similar vein, when they do maintain a thematic consistency across episodes, they're not developing that theme or saying anything new about it, but instead simply repeating what they've already said before. Take the idea of men becoming monsters. 
Angelo becomes one even though he did nothing wrong. He becomes a monster because of other people who were monsters long before him. The Prohibition Officer is a dedicated scene for this, but it's actually one of the least evil things he does in the series because no one dies and this Prohibition Officer was a nobody. If he and his family die, that's awful, but what did we know about them? Why would we feel for them in this world? In the real world, we would. Everyone has a story and that'd be tragedy. But here they literally have none. It was never written. So this scene adds nothing new, but takes up half an episode anyway. While Corteo's situation is different, thematically it's the same idea as Angelo's. He's innocent, but is forced to become a monster. But they wanted to have a dedicated relationship building scene, so he needed his sanity back and had lost all coherence. Nero even has a bit of this theme himself, with his first job at 14 being the one that killed Angelo's father and him not being able to kill Angelo in that moment. But this would rely on a lot of inference on how he became a monster. He became what he did presumably because of what the family needed, i.e. his part in saving it, but we don't actually see what he does or why or how, we just get a few lines where he says things like, I've killed so many people. So I can't point to exactly how it happens, just that it did happen, and that doesn't make for something deep. He simply touches on the idea and then brings nothing to it. Now, we can also look at another idea, say making sacrifices for your goals and is it worth the cost? Angelo gives everything up for revenge, okay that's a distinct thing although it doesn't go very deep. Uh, Frate gives up everything to try and save the family how he sees fit. Nero gives up everything to try and save the family how he sees fit. Vincent gives up everything to try and save the family how he sees fit. Theo gives up everything to... yeah. Everything is repeated and nothing is deep. This leaves it all at a very surface level. I mean, for instance, thematically you can get the message that revenge is costly and pointless, but that's all. The journey doesn't change Angelo past the first scene. The target of his revenge doesn't add anything to it. Uh, for the Venetis, maybe you could say the downfalls of pride. They all thought they could save the family everyone else failed to instead of working together like a real family. But again, that's all. You can't take an overall look at what destroys a family thematically because it's so similar for everyone. It's not distinct themes and the characters don't serve as individual examples of these same themes. A script on these ideas would be simply a couple pages because there's no real difference to method or motivation we can draw a message from. There's not enough lengthy change to create an example. Anyone who does change just does a 180 and calls it a day. As a comparison for this final point, I actually want to look at an anime which pretty much exclusively reinforces the same point across its entire run in Serial Experiments Lane. The whole anime is just Lane losing and finding herself in some way, literally warring with her other selves and their actions. The vehicle for this is technology, especially poignant as a classic anime in the midst of the 90s when the first generation to grow up on technology was born and we're now witnessing how it's changed our cultures, but that's just an interesting related side note. But that is where 91 Days would stop, it would just say technology changes us. But that's why I said with Lane, technology is the vehicle for this idea because it goes much deeper than that. Lane and her other self's change comes about from technology, but once that is established, it goes on to ask a different version of that question. Did you really change, or has this always been you? Has this always been a part of you? Furthermore, as it extends, it says, is there even a true version of you, and if so, how do you find it? While it may be making the same point throughout its entire run, what is the self, it's doing so in a deeper and distinguishable way every episode, laying a new baseline to build off of each iteration. This is what 91 Days was lacking by merely repeating itself at the same level. Overall, 91 Days is an average anime that serves as an example of how carefully crafted stories need to be to reach above the mark of average. But average itself is fine. I'm only hard on it because I think the idea was something very ambitious for the medium, and the marketing was pretty heavy on a seemingly deep and impactful rivalry, which I don't think we got. I wanted it to be better than it was, and no doubt that changed how I viewed the series. But average doesn't mean bad. For me, a 5 out of 10 is perfectly entertaining. It's something you can sit down and easily watch a couple episodes of over a few days, and the structure is probably even better for someone who maybe can only watch a few episodes here and there. The accents for the dub are honestly ridiculous, but I like them, they're cheesy in the right way. Everyone is constantly drinking, just finishing up a drink, or just pouring a drink, and it's a bit silly, but that's the world they built. There's even a scene of straight up flogging, but hey, again, that's... That's the world they built. I'm only hard on it for the same reason I am with the comic and kill. The potential was there, but just never got used as well as it could have been. 
and I feel for the team who had to squeeze their grand idea into 12 episodes. It's no easy task, and I don't know if I could bring myself to make the necessary cuts either. Creativity in a time and money driven world is a harsh thing, but that's a topic for another day. So that's most of my thoughts on 91 days. Um, a bit of a break from what we usually do here. I guess this is more of a standard review or comparison. So uh, as always, when it's something new, let me know how you thought about the video with likes, or comments, whatever. So that way I can measure the reaction to it. It also helps engagement being transparent as always, uh, but it does help me measure the reaction to it and say, oh, hey, I should do something like this again. So if it's something you want to see, let me know. It was definitely a nice break to put together something more technically focused like this. Uh, where I don't have to rack my brain constantly um, trying to connect the thematic dots of a series. But I can feel the ramble coming on, so I'll go ahead and move into the outro here. Uh, there's links in the pinned comment, Twitter, Discord, Twitch, where we usually do Thursday nights and Saturday afternoons for live stuff. Uh, but most importantly, my Patreon, where you can get your name at the end of videos like these lovely people above me right now. And when we get to, I'm, I want to say 10 people, we'll start doing some extra benefits there, like maybe a dedicated little patron cast for them, but we'll see about that. So anyway, thank you for watching. I hope I'll see you again soon.